So if we start off with you, City, is that okay? Yes. I'll just, I'll just put you on the spot there. <laughs> um, um, yeah, so um, my name is Stithi Paddy. Um, I am in first year, no, actually I'm in second year um, in Dunleary at IDT. Yeah. Um, my movie is called Every Day at 425. Um, it's a documentary about sort of um, the daily conversations I have with my grandfather and how it's uh, the repetitive the repetitiveness of it and um, showing a bit of his life as well. So, yeah. And was that inspired by, you know, you had to create a film as part of your course and then that was something personal to you in terms of the story? Is that would you, how did you decide on that really yeah. as a story? Um, mm -hmm. um, so the brief uh, was a personal project and it could be anything. So that was very personal to me because um, I am very close to him and uh, his life is very um, lonely and I did not want, I did want to explore that. Um, he lives alone in his empty house and um, just to keep him company, I do call him every day. So, but it does get a bit um, mundane and repetitive. So I wanted to explore that. And was most of it filmed then during the last six, nine months during lockdown? Yeah, so um, I had took a lot of photographs of him and I've encompassed like a lot of still imagery of his, of his like daily activities. Yeah. So um, I put them all together and um, the mm -hmm. only sort of um, shot I filmed of myself was during lockdown. So yes, it was all during, it was all filmed um, from the last uh, six to nine months. There we go. And do you think the story then that you told was the same story like if lockdown hadn't have happened like for example was it did you feel more um inclined to make sure that you were visiting your grand and everything during lockdown with that extra isolation inflicted on everybody yes um yeah actually my original plan was to go visit him like during lockdown in April but really that didn't happen at all um but yeah uh like sort of the lockdown did um emphasize the sort of the distance between us um and yes uh the fact that I usually do visit him every summer and now I haven't at all um and it's a big gap uh from the last time I visited him uh, is very, um, I guess like strenuous for him, but um, we'll see, we'll see. A very personal story and sensitively told. Um, so well done on being selected um, with every day at 14, 1625. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, great, thank you. Over to Tyler then. You're very welcome, Tyler. Can you tell us a little bit about your film, please? Yeah, of course. So I'm Tyler <clears throat> and um, Shannon's here as well. Oh, yes, you, of course. We co-directed the film Generation Activism together. This kind of about um, how the Black Lives Matter movement has gone on during the lockdown um, and how both of these things have come together, like the lockdown and the recent you know the news stories and the recent activism people have had yeah how they've kind of worked together and to give you know voices black voices a platform to tell their stories and the film is so very much fast-paced and energetic in that sense and very much because i suppose so much did happen in a short space of time was that something that you want to get across and the feel of the film and you know just getting that sort of nearly like a news documentary or a news reel of, of stuff through, you know, was that something that you thought about in terms of making an impact with the film? Uh, yeah, no, definitely. I think, <clears throat> you know, we, we kind of filmed it over the three months where things were like at their highest point. And as we were yeah. filming, more things would happen and we'd then be like, oh, we need to add this in. Like when the um, Edward Colston statue came down, 
of the slave trader and that happened and we thought wow this is it's such an iconic moment and such an important thing we feel to take these things so <laughs> yeah we wanted to include that things as they were happening and then like collaboratively then <laughs> Shannon, how how did the dynamic work between yourself and tyler you know what way as co-directors did you did you sort of play, did the film directing play out as such um yeah like we'd obviously known each other and did want to collaborate at some point in the future um but with everything that was going on we just felt as though it was so important to like um come forward and talk about it um so in terms of co-directing it was like a very collaborative process we were both very involved in contacting people um reaching out to people and also like collecting information and footage and everything so yeah i guess like that's sort of where the most like the more collaborative process comes into play. And what would you both say was the, the most challenging thing then about the production? Um, neither of us, we, like, I haven't seen Shannon in, in about a year. We were going to film like early this year, but then like a, like a fiction film, fiction short film, but then we couldn't. So we filmed the whole thing and with all the people we interviewed, we did it all over Zoom. Um, and like all over the phone and everything and none of us ever met up. So it was, um, it was challenging to get that all set up. And when we were editing together, like um, we'd get on Zoom and I'd share my screen and we'd just kind of go through it that way. Yeah, yeah. So I suppose as well, like you develop skills that you, you never thought you would have to do as well. Like I think even with all of the online activity and having to edit online and all of that, it just shows you when you have to sort of find a solution to something you can. Um, so but yeah well done an extremely important message to get across and using film as the platform is such a strong um vehicle i suppose to get that message communicated um so i, I wish you both um every success and hopefully you can continue working together and you can meet up in person in the not too distant, <laughs> yeah. in the not too distant yeah, future um well done um tom then hi tom how are you hi. thanks yeah, very well. good um so if you can introduce your film, please. Uh, yeah, so I'm Tom and myself, Kate and Hannah uh, all worked on our film Oddities and Wonders um, during a, uh, a BFI organised sort of uh, course. It was like a sort of a boot camp experience uh, and we had a sort of uh, short-ish period of time, sort of five days uh, to sort of uh, come up with this idea and film it in sort of a large a large team of sort of 20 of us was split it down into uh, smaller groups um, and we each had um, different interpretations of the where of, of the brief um, to sort of different ways to capture um, the idea of the sort of uh, the musical tradition um, and the history of it, um, and I think that's that's reflected in the uh, the sort of the range of of things that's shown in the film and its sort of diversity of, um, of uh, methodology. And which BFA Film Academy did you say it was? Um, Kate, Hannah, you'll have to help me out with this one. Media, media active. I believe. Yeah, oh, right. yes, yes, yes. Okay, brilliant. Okay, well, um, so yes, well, thanks, Tom and Kit and Hannah. So, you know, I'm sure, I don't know, but I'm sure each of you have worked on projects where it was just yourself and maybe one or two other people. How did you find that then in terms of a big team of that, like 18, 19, 20 people? Did it, I suppose there were pros and cons, but Hannah, maybe like, would you be able to chat about that a wee bit just you know, was there any learning curves from working with a crew of that size? Um, yeah, definitely. There was like, obviously when you're working individually, you can only use your ideas so you don't have other people, you know, agreeing or disagreeing with what you're saying. Yeah. And you all have to sort of work together to come up with an idea that works for all of you, not just a couple. Yeah. Um, and would it have been the case where, like, did everyone get to work on the specific area that they wanted to or was anyone sort of multitasking and, and maybe tried something new that they didn't think they were particularly interested in for example Kate were you working across a few things production and writing and directing was it sort of a 
a juggling effort? Well, my main part of the film was the dancing, which is involved. Um, so I was kind of performing it, but then we had like three or four people behind the camera doing that. So we were all kind of in our own different groups working on a specific thing and then it would all go together. But then some people, well, some people would jump over to the writing side and write a bit of the script for the next group and then we'd edit someone else's clips together. And it was all really, everyone was involved in everything really. It was, it was really good. That's great. And as well as that, I suppose for future projects, you all now sort of know a range of people who have a range of skills, yes. uh, you know, from that. So I think that's always important when you're going forward with projects and it's sort of knowing the right people to approach and who you've got a good relationship and rapport with. Um, so that's hopefully helpful as well for you in that regard. Um, well, thank you. Um, and we look forward to having our audiences um, through Cinemagic enjoying, enjoying the film. Um, over to Jamie then. Thanks, Jamie, for joining us. I am. <clears throat> You're very welcome. So uh, my, I'm a recent cinematic arts graduate from uh, Ulster University. Um, um, my film is Derry Halloween, Behind the Walls, The Other World Awakens. Uh -huh. And it, it was about the preparations for the 2019 Halloween celebrations in Derry, which uh, has been rated one of the biggest Halloween celebrations in the world. Um, so the university were approached by the Northwest Carnival Initiative uh, just a little bit less than two weeks before Halloween, asking if any students were interested in taking on a project to document the uh, celebrations. Okay. So I uh, volunteered to take on the project and went down and met up with Jim Collins, who's the project coordinator of the Northwest Carnival. Um, on the 17th of October uh, and the next day I was in Mullaboy Primary School filming uh, and it was just sort of right up from then up to Halloween it was filming most days and uh, working with the in the carnival. And, very, sorry the very next day that's where you were straight yeah, in? On very very next day so it was straight away straight into it I went down met with him and he said oh is there any chance you're free tomorrow? So I went down into the primary school and they were filming, making props for the parade. And uh, they were making props. And then it was days working in the carnival, filming them, just making the costumes and interviewing Jim and some of the other makers for it. Excellent. And I mean, was this something, I suppose, like story wise that you had a vision for like once you knew what the project was or was it more a case of documenting what was unfolding it was very fluid um i think i went away that so i think it was a thursday i met up with jim uh the friday i filmed and then i went away that weekend and came up with the questions and worked out and interviewed jim that following week um and then it was the case of piecing together what he had said and uh, working out around the events as well. Um, but it was also trying to work with the council uh, mm -hmm. to get permission to film in the event so I could get into the parade uh, to actually film. And that's probably something as well that will stand you in good stead for future filmmaking when there are, and especially, well, any production, but, you know, having to get on board um, permissions from councils and local um, authorities and things like that. Um, so as, I, would you say that was a learning curve for you as well? Yeah, it was a lot of getting press access and getting the media first and filling out risk assessments and everything. Um, I'm actually just heading back home from filming with them today um, because they're going virtual this year. So I've been in filming stuff for them at the minute. Brilliant. Well, that'll be interesting to see how they, they do that in a virtual compa capacity. Yeah, it's it. at the moment it's all like filming tutorials at how you can celebrate at home. So they okay find that at the minute. Super okay. Well, Jamie, thank you. Um, I know you're familiar with Cinemagic through a, diff a few different veins. Yeah. Um, so well done on, on being shortlisted in the Young Filmmaker Competition, and absolutely, it'll have a great audience in Northern Ireland with the focus being um, the Derry Halloween Festival. Um, 
So thank you so much. And we all look forward to, to having that in the, in the showcase. Um, thank you. Um, so last but not least then, Hassan, thank you for joining us. Hi there. Hi, Claire. Thank you for having me. No problem. Um, congratulations on getting shortlisted in the competition. Thank you. Um, and thanks for making time to join us this afternoon. So can you tell us about your film and how it came to be and um, how really it was, it got off the ground, really? Absolutely. So the film is called Hell and Forward. And I, and I went around a lot trying to choose the right name for this film because it's really a, a dark film. And it recounts something that's happening all the time around us. But there is a kind of positive message there at the end. And so it recounts the story of two humans, two males, as they travel from Libya to Lampedusa. And that's really in the backdrop of thousands of individuals making that journey, that very, very dangerous journey, from war-torn Libya, from prisons in Libya, over to Europe in effort to try and gain asylum, in effort to try and gain a better life for many different reasons. And so I'd been reading about this on the news and mainly um, just tales recounting a mass or swarm of people, um, very dehumanized. And I'd heard the words migrant and refugees thrown around. And then I ended up reading a book um, by Patrick Kingsley, who was the Guardian's migration correspondent at the time, um, called The New Odyssey. And he basically followed different people from throughout the continent of Africa over to Lampedusa and then upwards to Germany and to, to, to France. And I decided I needed to do that to my, for myself to kind of figure out what was, what was happening and understand it from my own perspective. So I made a journey over to Lampedusa. Um, and I, as I was there, I stayed there for a few, um, a few weeks and, and then kind of traveled upwards to, to Calais, going from city to city, just talking to different people, NGOs, refugees, uh, people without papers. And these two um, guys in, the, in this documentary t tell us a, a story of, of their journey, but from very different perspectives as well. One is very, very descriptive. He tells you kind of all the different details, the horrific details of what he went through. And the other individual who preferred not to be named is, is very reclusive. He doesn't give too much information. And it really, in my opinion, kind of gives you a sense of the humanity of the situation, that there are different people going through the struggle every day. Um, and it's, it was, it's very grounded in that respect. Excellent. And of course, documentary is the platform as well to get this type of light shone on that on that issue and obviously all of the issues that you all have examined today like documentary is able in that way as a genre to completely just sort of give a real life insight to something and really propel that issue and you know raise awareness around it um so i'm sure that was was actually a great experience traveling and you know as a documentary filmmaker you were doing that as in the best way possible to sort of make the best film so you were able to follow the footsteps of um you know the people that were making that that journey um mm. so congratulations and um a tall a tall order and a tall task but you certainly achieved that and, and it's something very innovative and a very important message to get across as well I think it's topical as well, especially in, in the UK right now with, with all these discussions about what's going on on the border. And I think it's important to, to recognise, you know, these are human stories, just like you and me. Completely. And it's interesting because you, you do wonder if, not to go back to lockdown, but you do wonder with, um, you know, with if all the border issues and the migration issues that are happening now, like what way would it have been a year ago or two, you know, when COVID wasn't in the equation, like, um, you know, certain issues are now at the top of the agenda over certain other issues. And obviously with generation activism as well, you know, it's interesting how the public perception of things maybe changes or the news agenda changes as well, depending on what at that particular moment in time news agencies think should be top of the agenda. Um, so that's why I think it's really important for you and you guys and um you know hats off to you as well in terms of raising such important issues and and giving them a voice thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe